Welcome to the third part of our conversation with Dr. Christoph Rico about the meaning of Alma in Isaiah 714. If you go to the entry page on Wikipedia for this word, you'll find this. Despite its importance to the account of the virgin birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, scholars agree that it has nothing to do with virginity. Full stop. They sound very sure of themselves. And this tide needs to be turned. Dr. Rico is helping us see how this sort of definition is completely wrong based on the evidence and it's unhelpful and obscures the contextual meaning of Isaiah 714. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. about a virgin. It doesn't use the Hebrew word for virgin, which is betula. It uses the Hebrew word for a young woman, which is alma. And again, many, many Christian commentaries and translations agree to this. They admit as much. Most modern Christian translations of Isaiah translate it as a young woman and not as a virgin. This is a rabbi on a YouTube clip from Jews for Judaism. What he says gives a good summary of why we're taking three episodes to talk about this thoroughly. So let's get back to Dr. Rico and see what more he has to say about the issue. There is a second text, which is extremely interesting. It's a text where you have alumim, so it's the abstract noun. So, you know, in in biblical Hebrew, when you have the ending im, it could be used for the abstract. For instance, you have nar means a young boy. If you have neurim, it's a youth. Alma means a virgin. If you have alumim, if it refers to to a woman, it's virginity. If young virginity, if I, if I want to be precise, because it, it, it would be only used for, for a young woman. And then elem means a, a young boy. And if you have alumim referring to a young boy, it will be uh, youth. I mean, the, the age where you are a teenager. So you have Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, and that's interesting. It's precisely in the book of Isaiah, chapter 54. You have a very beautiful text where there is a kind of enumeration of the different categories of women who don't have children. So we have to understand something very important, and it is that in uh, antiquity, and especially in the Middle East, if a woman doesn't have children, so if she is not married, and if she doesn't have any children, this is a calamity. Because what is uh, glorious for a woman in the, the middle, in the ancient Middle East and in all the Arabic world is uh, for a woman is to have children. I have grown up in Morocco. I was in Morocco till the age of 12. And uh, I remember, I mean, there was a woman, Moroccan woman, who was helping at home. And we communicated with her in half in broken French and uh, half Arabic because we didn't speak Arabic well. She didn't speak French. She spoke a very broken French. And uh, we, and this is how I was exposed to Arabic. And uh, uh, my sister, my old sister, when she was, I mean, I was 11, perhaps, and she was already 18. And each time, this woman would tell her in Arabic, you should already be married. It's a shame. Like that. So, and that is exactly the traditional mentality that you have in the Middle East. A woman has to be married. She has to have children. Look at Hannah. So, from that perspective, you have chapter 54 in Isaiah, where uh, you have the description of the different cases where you have a drama for a woman because she doesn't have any children. So, sing, O sterile one. So, the first case is the akara, the sterile one. You who have not born children, break forth into cries of joy, into loud cries, you who have not brought a child into the world. For the sons of the solitary one will be more numerous 
than the sons of, of she whom a husband possesses, says the Lord. So here we have the second category, the solitary one, the one who has not been married. Then the text says, Enlarge the space of your tent. Stretch out your curtains without holding back the curtains of your habitation and lengthen your stakes. Reinforce your gate poles for you will break out to the right and to the left and your seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Okay, and then we have the interesting part. It is said the following. Do not be afraid. You will no longer experience shame. Do not be confused. You will no longer need to blush. For you will forget the shame of your alumim. You will no longer remember the humiliation of your widowhood. So here, it's a typical parallelism where you have Two other situations where a woman cannot have children. Two other cases. We had first the case of the sterile woman, then the case of the woman who is solitary. Uh, later afterwards, we will have the woman who is Azuva, who has been abandoned by her husband um, before she got children. But here we have two cases. The case of widowhood, which is a humiliation, because first she was not humiliated, she had a husband, but now she doesn't have a, a husband anymore, so it's a humiliation, and the word that we have in Hebrew means that there is a humiliation. And the other one is the shame. That means it has always, it is like that. It is, a state, it is a state like that. It is not a humiliation. It is a state where you are in shame because of your alumim, of your state of being alma. And look at what happens afterwards. Because your creator is the one who possesses you. Yahweh Sabaoth is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, Goel. He is called the God of all the earth. Let us start with the second case. So, you have a Goel, a Redeemer. So, let's refresh our memories real quick about what a Goel does in the Bible. The Zondervan Encyclopedia of the Bible says, The term is used frequently in the Old Testament with reference to the person who is next of kin and his respective duties. One of those duties was to buy back what his poor brother had sold and could not himself regain. Leviticus 25, 25-26. He was also the recipient of the restitution that might be due to a next of kin. Numbers 5, 8. The story of Ruth illustrates the responsibility of the Redeemer to purchase land belonging to one deceased who was next of kin, to marry his widow, and to raise up children for the deceased. Ruth 2, 20 and 4, 14. In addition, the Goel was to avenge any wrong done to a next of kin, particularly murder. Numbers 35, 12. The Goel goes with the widow. So, the goel is the one who redeems the widow. And then, what I tra translated as the one who possesses you, which is the word boel, that person is the one who goes with the alma. Sometimes, we could, f we could have the impression that the Bible is a little bit crude, you know? But we have to understand that we are talking about covenant. Uh, marriage is a covenant. We are talking about that. And a uh, covenant is always applied to God with his people. Here the woman is the, 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 the people of Israel. It's a metaphor, which is a metaphor which might be crude, but which uh, refers to the covenant between God and his people. And in the same way as you have a boel that goes with an alma, so he becomes the, the husband of the alma, in the same way God has made a covenant with his people. So, what is important here is that we are talking about an experience of shame or an experience of humiliation, and these experiences are going to stop. So, the humiliation of the widow will stop with the goel. Once you have the Redeemer, the widow is not anymore a widow. She is married again. So, she has her goel. She has her Redeemer. So, her humiliation stops. Her situation of widowhood stops. 
there is no more widowhood because there is a goel, a redeemer. Then we have the Alma. There is a boel who comes. So the word boel, it can have two different meanings. One is the, the fact of possessing land. But the, the first and primary meaning, and uh, more frequent in the Bible, is the fact of possessing a woman. I mean, the, the, the sexual intercourse. This is the meaning of the word boel. What will stop with the boel? It's the alumim. So what is alumim if it is not young virginity? Tell me, how can I understand the text otherwise? Many times it is not well, and well translated, by the way. But this is what the, me the text means. It cannot mean just youth. Because if it meant youth, from the moment you have a goel, you don't stop to be a young woman, you see? It has to mean something else. These two occurrences of uh, the word alma or alumin referred to a woman are extremely compelling. I mean, because we fail to understand the logic of the text if we don't understand, if we don't give to the word alma the precise meaning of young virginity. Uh, there is also the passage of uh, Isaiah 62 that is very reminiscent of Isaiah 54. And there you have all, uh, exactly the same phraseology uh, with different words. Uh, but you have also uh, the word boel. You have also, uh, instead of having uh, the word alma, there you have betula. So this is what Isaiah 62.5 says. For as a young man marries a young woman... Betula, so shall your sons marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And this verse works along with Isaiah 54, 4 to shed light on one another. So here's what Isaiah 54, 4 through 5 says once again, Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded. For you will not be disgraced, for you will forget the shame of your youth, that is, your alumim, and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband, Yahweh of armies is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. So we have Psalm 68. Here's what verses 24 through 26 of Psalm 68 say. Your procession is seen, O God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers in front, the musicians last, in the midst of virgins, alamut, playing tambourines. Bless God in the great congregation, Yahweh, O you who are of Israel's fountain. And so, one thing to keep in mind is this procession that it talks about is the procession of the Ark of the Covenant to the sanctuary, which we are going to see connecting to First Chronicles later. Kidmu Sharim, so the singers go forth. Achar Nognim, and behind you have the players of string instruments. So a Nogen is the man who plays a string instrument. And then you have Betoch Alamot Tofefot, among the Alamot who are drumming, playing the drum. So I, I was intrigued by the fact that you have two categories of people singing here. You have the Sharim, the singers, who are male singers, but nobody tells us what their age is. But then, when it comes to female singers, they are alamot. They have a specific age. And then I was surprised to see that also in Greece, many times you have choirs where you have men and very young girls singing together. Here's an approximation of that by the Trinity Choir of Men and Girls 
singing a Gaelic blessing. So this is uh, surprising. Why is that the case? I talked with a musician and he explained me the following thing. First of all, in antiquity, you didn't have polyphony. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term polyphony, it's music arranged in different parts for several voices or the simultaneous combination of two or more tones or melodic lines. The term derives from the Greek word for many sounds. So even a single interval made up of two simultaneous notes or a chord of three simultaneous tones is rudimentarily polyphonic. So let's start with an example of monophony. Now, here's an example of polyphony. These girls would most likely fall into the alamot category. Polyphony is a recent thing. If you want to have, obviously, female voices and male voices are not the same. If you want to have male singers and female singers singing together in a culture that didn't know anything about polyphony, the only way was to have an octave of difference between the melody sung by women and the melody sung by men. And then they could sing together. So the problem is the following. If you have young boys and young girls, there is no problem because they have almost the same voice. Okay. Before before puberty, boys and girls have almost the same voice. So you could have boys and girls very young uh, singing together. There's no problem. For example, here's a young boys choir from the movie Perfect Harmony. Now, boys and girls at the beginning, they have a soprano voice. They, there, is, there is a slight difference between boys and girls, but more or less they have the same range of uh, notes that they can sing, and they can perfectly sing together. There's no problem. When a boy reach, reaches puberty, the change of his voice is sudden, very sudden. In one week, his voice has changed. And he becomes either a tenor or a bass. Most of boys will become tenor. Okay? This is the most common voice for male voices. So what happens with girls? Also, in the case of girls, they, their voice matures. It doesn't happen in the same way as boys. It, it takes longer. Girls' voice mature between the ages of 9 and 14, very gradually. And at the end of this process, girls who are all soprano at the beginning 
Some of them will become alto, and some of them will remain soprano, but their voice becomes wider in the lower range. So what does it mean? It means if, if I want to have tenors singing with women, the best way is to have young girls who have not yet matured, because there won't be any alto. You know, alto is already different. If you have altos and tenors, it's difficult to, to, to sing together. But the difference between tenor and soprano is an octave. So that's perfect. And also there is another reason, and it is because the soprano voice of a girl who is before puberty is not the same as the soprano voice of a woman after puberty. Because the soprano voice of a girl before puberty is much more flexible. It, it has, look, I am not an expert in these things, but this is what, uh, what is said, that there is a kind of flexibility or there is a kind of quality in that voice that is special. And this is why there were many choirs where you had young girls and mature men singing together. And then you had a difference of an octave and then a very beautiful female voice with a classical male voice, I would say. This helps us understand that you had Kidmu Sharim, so you have the singers that go forth. Then behind, you have both the players of uh, string instruments and the alamot. Why? Because the players of string instruments tend to, to, to play on a higher pitch. And it's better that the girls are with them in order that they follow the lead of the players and they can help men to follow their lead, you know, because uh, usually it is the highest pitch that, that gives the lead. You know, when you, you want to start a concert, you hear the key in a concert first, ding, you hear, and then you, which is a high note, you hear a, a high note, and then you know uh, what is the note and you can follow, all right, but the note has to be high. If it is low, it is more difficult to distinguish. So it's important that the girls, these young girls who are alamot, are behind with the string players, because like that they can give the lead. And now we understand First Chronicles 15, 19, 20. The context for this passage is the procession for transporting the ark. Here's what it says. The singers, Heman, Asaf, and Ethan, were to sound bronze cymbals. Zechariah, Aziel, Shemiramot, Yehiel, Uni, Eliab, Maaseah, and Benaiah were to play harps according to, wait for it, Alamot. Again, popular translations like the KJV, NIV, NASB, ESV all simply transliterate the word as Alamot. The NLT simply omits any translation of the last two words in Hebrew in this verse, which are al alamot, according to alamot. The Amplified Bible has in brackets, that is, a high pitch. The International Standard Version says, played harps to accompany the women singers. So they translate it as women singers. The literal standard version says, with psalteries over the girls' voices, and voices is in brackets. Young's literal translation simply says, with psalteries besides virgins. And a psaltery is another word for something like a harp or a lyre. Then verse 21 continues with the following, but matithia elifelehu mignea Obed Edom, Yeyel, and Azaziah were to lead with liars according to the Sheminit. Because there you have two phrases, Al Alamot and Al Ashminit. Al Alamot is on the tone of the Alamot, on the tone of the young uh, virgins. And Al Ashminit, but young virgins, I mean, the age is between 12 and 13. So that's, that's an Alma. Uh, an Alma is a very specific age. The girl who has, is at a marriageable age 
and, and she is between 12 and 13 years old. There you have the, the, the phrase, ala labot and ala shminit. In shminit, you, you, you hear the word shmone in Hebrew, which is, means eight. So it is the octave. The singers were to sound the bronze cymbals. Then you have Zechariah, Ariel, and other singers were to play the harps, benevalim, according to the alamot, uh, on the tone of the alamot. And then Matithaya, Elifelehu, and others were to play the lyre, be kinorot in Hebrew, directing according to shmenit. So that's very important. Let us start with the end. You have a group of singers who play the lyre, Bekinorot, and they direct. That's a very important phrase because you have the same uh, verb at the beginning of the, in the titles of the Psalms, la menatseach, la menatseach, to the one who leads the choir. Okay? So they are directing. Why? Because they are playing a high pitch instrument. So they are playing according to Schminit on the octave. An octave below, you have the alamot. So you have the play according to the alamot, which is the play of the harps, nevalim. So we translate harps and lyre, these two, but in fact there are instruments of antiquity. It's neither an harp nor a, a lyre. It's, uh, those are specific instruments. So we have the kinor and the nevel. Those are the two names of these instruments in singular in Hebrew, kinor and nevel. So I will start by the highest one. It is the kinor. So the kinor is the instrument in this passage that is giving the, the lead, that is directing the melody, because it's, it's higher. So they are playing on the eighth string, on the shminit, on the, on the octave. They are playing higher, an octave higher than the, the harp players. By the way, we know perfectly that in the Middle East, in antiquity, they knew the octave. It was a, a heptatonic music and not a pentatonic music in the Middle East. There's no doubt about that. So when, when we translate as Shminit as an octave, we know that uh, this is uh, perfectly sound because the specific music of all the populations in the Middle East, uh, traditional populations of the Middle East, traditional cultures of the Middle East, is a culture of heptatonic music where they knew the octave. The heptatonic scale is a scale with seven tones or pitches. We're familiar with one of them, Let's count the notes here with Julie Andrews. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Do, when you know the notes to sing, you can sing most steady But there are many different heptatonic scales. Here are some Persian, Turkish, and Arabic scales from YouTuber Oud for Guitarists. So, we have the kinar. So, it's interesting that the Talmud says that the strings that were made for the kinar were made from the small intestine of sheep. And the kinor, in some uh, coins that we have from the period of Bar Kokhva, we can see a kinor, and we know that it had a small resonance chamber. Whereas the nevel, so the word that we translate as harps, it was made, according to the Talmud, the strings were made from the large intestine of sheep, and in the coins of Bar Kokhva, we see that it had a larger resonance chamber. The, 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 the instrument had a larger resonance chamber, so it gave a lower tone. So you have the kinor, which is the highest tone. It's impossible to sing. Even an alma cannot sing at that tone. It's the kinor. It plays alashminit. 
And then you have the Nevalim, which is basically the, to- the tone of, of the Alamot, of the young virgins. And that's uh, a little lower, an octave, an octave lower. And this is the tone al Alamot. So now we understand when we have the titles of some psalms, of some psalms where you have al Alamot, on the tone of the Alamot, this is how you have, because it is says, Lam Natser, to the one, to the master of the choir. Al Alamot, on the tone of the young virgins. And then you have another indication that tells you how to sing it. So, but you have elements that help to sing, to that help people to sing. I mean, it's it's a very specific vocabulary, you know. And then you have other songs where you have alashminit on the octave. For those of you who are musicians or want to read more on this musical issue, there's a ton of detail along with references in Dr. Rico's book, so you can check that out there. Really, I am very much indebted to uh, Michel Petrosian, who is a composer, and, has, and, and he is all, he, he's also very interested in the Bible, and he has published even on the Bible. So uh, you have here someone, a man, who is both very, very aware of what the Bible is and who is a real composer. So uh, he helped me uh, write the passages that were related to, to musicology. Uh, I couldn't have done that alone. Everything, suddenly, when you understand these kind of things, you, you start understanding everything. You start understand, understanding why you have this phrase, al la mort. So the Alma, in fact, is a girl who is 12, 13 years old, maximum 14. That's it. That's an Alma. Otherwise, she will be called a Neara, a young woman or a young girl. An Alma is a particular case of a Neara. It's a girl who is very young, who is not yet married, and who is virgin. So now we can talk about uh, Isaiah 7.14. My point is the following. We have a sign, a sign that has been given at the depths of the Sheol or above in the highest of heavens. So this is a cosmic sign. It's an incredible sign because it's the most impressive sign that you could have. It is true that the word sign is not the same thing as a miracle. Uh, A sign is, is not necessarily a miracle. But here it is a sign very specific sign. It's a sign that is as for a sign either in the depths of Sheol or above in heaven. And uh, Rashi, who is a rabbi from the 11th century, it's one of the most important Jewish rabbis, he says, commenting, ask a sign in the Sheol, he says, well, for instance, asking to resurrect a dead. You see, he was well aware that this uh, sign was something uh, completely extraordinary, okay? It's not just that you have a woman who has a child and she calls uh, that child uh, Emmanuel and that's it. No, that's not really uh, a sign. So the thing is, we have here the mother, the name of the mother is not mentioned. The only thing we know about the mother is that she is an Alma. This is the only thing. Hmm? Behold, the Alma... Uh, will conceive and bear a child and name uh, him Emmanuel, or he will be named Emmanuel according to the to the variant readings. We will go, we will talk about that afterwards. So the father is not mentioned either. So and which is very very unusual in a Semitic context. You always have the name of the of, of the father. The name of the father is very important in a patriarchal society as uh, Arab. Uh, society is and as Jewish society in antiquity was so uh, you had to give the name of the father but here you don't have it unless unless it all depends on the on the variant reading because you have two variant readings you we have she will call her son Emmanuel but you have a vekarat, so it's uh, you have a, a, a t at the end but you have a, another variant reading which is vekara and which is a passive and he will be called so that variant reading, Peter Gentry is uh, making, uh, is giving compelling arguments for that, and I was also talking about that in my book. 
It's a variant reading that you have in Qumran. It's a variant reading that you have in the Pshita. And Matthew, Matthew, in uh, Matthew 1, 25, he says, Kalesusin, they will call him Emmanuel, which means that he has read the passive. You know, because Kalesus, Kalesusin, they will call him, he will be called, you see? So it's a divine passive. What, what does it mean? It means that you avoid pronouncing the name of God. So many times to talk about the actions of God, you give the passive. He will be called, so God will, will call him. It's the same thing. We cannot be sure 100% about the original uh, reading. Was it Vekara, he, was he will be called, or was it Vekarat, she will call? There are, it seems, uh, the mo I mean, I think the most probable reading is Vekara, he will be called. Why? Because it was very uncommon that a woman would call her child, would give the name, her, her child uh, a name. It, it was always the father who did that. Look, for instance, at Zachariah. He, he cannot speak, but he is the one who gives the name. And he said, uh, his name is John. Then there is the fact that you have it at Qumran, and that you have it in the Pshita, which is a very ancient translation, and that the Septuagint, as quoted by Matthew, has Kalesusin. So it implies also Vekara. So that's, that's compelling. Then, instead, you have Vekara, she will call, so you have the Masoretic text, but this is already 7, 8 century AD, but you have the Vulgate, so it's pre-Masoretic, so already Jerome uh, read Vekarat. So the most probable thing is that we had first Vekarat, and then at one stage it became Vekarat. But anyway, so in any case, we don't have a mention of the mother, of the name of the, mo of the mother, we don't have a mention of the name of the Father unless we consider that it's a divine passive and then the, the, the Father is God. As we have with the second character that happens in Isaiah 9, uh, where you have Vekara Shmo and he will be named Pele Yoetz, so um, wonderful counselor and powerful God and eternal Father and Prince of Peace. Okay, But he will be named. So, no mention of the mother, no mention of the father. The only thing we know about the mother is that she is an Alma. If we consider that an Alma is a young woman, well, you know, if you have to be a young woman to, to bear a child. So that's not a, an information, you see? He was not the son of Akaz, of King Akaz, because Akaz, according to all the books, to all the references in the Bible, where uh, we have a, a reference to Akaz, it is never said that he had a child named Emmanuel. And then the oracle was not directly addressed to Akaz, because Akaz didn't want to hear the oracle. This is why he's saying, uh, I won't tempt God. And then Isaiah says, you don't ask for a sign. God himself will give a sign. Listen to me, house of David. So the, the, the sign is given not to Akaz, but the, to, to all the dynasty, to the house of David. So then Okay, we could say, okay, what is the sign? A sign is, is, is the sign that there will be a boy that will be born? Is that a sign? Is the sign that the fact that he is called Emmanuel? So Emmanuel is not a special name. Okay, the meaning Emmanuel has a, a very deep meaning within Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8. Okay, but as such, it's not a very special name because it's, uh, there are so many theophoric names in the Bible, in, among first names in ancient Israel, there are instances of, of, of names very, very similar to Emmanuel. We have in a seal from the time of Hezekiah, who was the son of uh, King Akaz, we have the word in, the, in that seal, the word Imadiyahu. So the, it's a name, it's a, it's, it's a person name, Imadiyahu. Imadiyahu means Yahweh is with me. And then in a papyrus from Elephantine, from the 5th century BC, uh, we have Imanu Ya. So Yahweh is with us. It's almost the same thing as Immanuel. So if one gave the word to the word Alma the meaning of celibate, noble woman, what the reader would struggle to discern would be precisely the object of the sign given to the house of David. We have an unknown girl who is pregnant. We don't know who the father is. 
She births a child and gives her son, or her son is given, according to the variant readings, a name which does not sound strange in ancient Israel among the numerous theophoric names that were given to, to, to children. I mean, if we take, for instance, the, the, in, in, in Isaiah 7, the sons of Isaiah, so Maher Shalal Chash uh, Baz, this is, this is a very, very strange name. Or Shar uh, Yashuv, a rest will come back. This is a completely strange name. This name is a sign, you see? But if I say Emmanuel, this is normal business, you know? I would, I would dare say. I mean, uh, it, of course, the word Emmanuel then takes a, a very deep meaning, but, but that's a, a different story. So we have the parents who remain anonymous. The child remains unknown. Even, even the fact that he is eating curds and honey. Okay, this is normal, normal meals for children. This is standard. I mean, there's nothing strange in that. There are, there are some elements that are given by that information because it has to do with the fact that the land will be desolate and then there will only be uh, the cows. You will have honey, which is uh, wild, and then you have milk. So this is what people will eat. Then you have also the fact that it is the land, the promised land, which is where you have uh, milk and honey, which is flowing. flowing. So you have both a sign of hope and a sign of despair. It is, it is ambiguous. But the, the, the fact is that it's, it's not very consistent as a sign. So we, have not, we don't have a single word about the role of the Emmanuel, I mean, if, we, if I take the two other characters that we have in, in, the, in chapters 7 to 12 in Isaiah. So El Gibor, for instance, the, one, the, the boy who has four names. One of them is El Gibor, powerful, mighty God, mighty God. Okay, we don't know who the father is or who the mother is because a child has been born to us. Okay, but at least we know that he will sit upon the throne of David. That is something very specific. Uh, so, um, but here, nothing. Where is the sign in the depths of Sheol or above in the highest places? Where is, this, where is that sign in the depths of Sheol or above in the highest places? If the Alma is not a virgin, where is the sign? If the Alma, conversely, if the Alma is a virgin, this is a, a sign. This is a tremendous sign above in the highest, in the highest places or in the depths of Sheol. You see? Even Rashi, even Rashi, in his commentary to Isaiah, one of the explanations he gives, it's amazing, one of the explanations, and Rashi uh, was not, uh, how can I put it, he was not precisely a philo-Christian rabbi, but one of the explanations he gives to explain the word Alma is the following. That was the sign. Because she was an Alma, she was not supposed to bear a son. So, we do have three characters, and each time uh, in chapters 7 to 12 in Isaiah, and each time we have a little more information. So each time the, the, the figure of the Messiah, I am talking within a Christian perspective, of course, the figure of the Messiah becomes more clear. So first we have the Emmanuel, which is a very mysterious figure. We know that it that he is linked to the dynasty of David. How? We don't know, but there is a link with the dynasty of David because he has been announced to the house of David. We know that his name is God with us or God is with us. Then we know that he was born from a virgin and we know that he is king. Why? How come we can know that he is a king? Because the second time the word appears in Isaiah 8, it is said, and his wings will be deployed over the whole extent of your land, O Emmanuel. Your land, O Emmanuel. This is the way one of the medieval rabbis was saying that this is the way you talk about a king. When you say your land, it's the king who has a land. So he's a king. But this is all what we know. Then we have El Gibor, mighty God. Mighty God, El Gibor, is going to sit upon the throne of David, so we know that he is a successor of David. He will be in the, on the throne of David as a successor of David. This is a little more information than before. Before we knew only that the Emmanuel was 
linked to the, to the house of David. Now we know that he is a successor of, of King David. We know that he has names that can only be born by God. Like mighty God, like wonderful counselor, eternal father, everlasting father. And we know that he has been announced to a collective us. Okay? Because he is born to us. A child has been born to us. And the us is Judah and Israel. So it is not only for the house of David, but also for Judah and Israel, because a child is born to us. And a son has been given to us. Then when we go to the root or stamp of Jesse, we know that he is not only linked to the dynasty of David, he is not only a successor of David, but he is a descendant of David, because he is from the root of Jesse. And he is not only uh, a sign for the house of David, not only for Judah and Israel, but also for all people. Because it is said that he will be a signal for all people, and the Spirit of the Lord will lay upon him. Man, wasn't that such a rich exposition? I hope you enjoyed and appreciated that as much as I did. Another big thank you to Dr. Rico for sharing his wealth of insight with us. Now, before you go, I want to mention something important. If you look at the entry for Isaiah 714 on Wikipedia, you'll find once again that they consider the case to be closed, that Alma does not specifically mean virgin. The same is true of the entry for Alma. So if some of you out there listening to this would be willing to submit additions or corrections to these Wikipedia articles, please go ahead and do it by quoting Dr. Rico's book. Add a little bit of debate and pushback on what supposedly is a foregone conclusion. People need to have all the information and be allowed to think for themselves. So let's please help the world by encouraging Wikipedia to present a more balanced picture. You'll find links to those entries in the description. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help us all become more like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.